Hi, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Simone. I'm community manager with the OED marketing team, and I'll be hosting the session today. I'll be, I'm delighted to be here with Dr. Tanya Stiles, who will be talking to us about the new ideas around visualizing etymology on the OED. And um, now, um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Tanya so she can begin. Thanks very much, Simone. And welcome, everybody. Um, it's brilliant that you could all join us this afternoon. First, I want to thank you so much for setting aside this hour at what I know is a really busy time for everybody. It's very much appreciated. Over the last few months, mostly over lockdown, we've been exploring some possibilities for creating a tool that presents the OED's etymological information in a visual format. And today, I want to share some of these first ideas and sketches with you, fresh from the drawing board, really. Um, so I must stress from the outset, this tool doesn't exist yet, even as a prototype. The purpose of this session really is to introduce the concept and to test the waters with you, to find out whether you, this is an option that you'd like us to offer. Um, and if so, what kinds of functionality you'd find most useful in your research and teaching. So I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes or so presenting, and then I'm gonna leave the rest of the hour for questions and discussion. Your insights will be really invaluable to us as we look towards future development. So I do hope when the time comes, you won't be shy. So first things first, why would we want to visualize etymologies? Over the past few years, quite a lot of research has been going on at Oxford Languages to find out just how the OED data set is being used in the academic community and to identify ways in which we might meet needs better. In this consumer outreach, etymologies are consistently singled out as an aspect of the dictionary that uses value particularly highly, which is great. Another message that comes through loud and clear is that a lot of researchers are quite keen to make more of the etymological information that the OED offers. In fact, in a survey that we did recently, when users of the OED were asked what they would do with unrestricted access to the whole of the dictionary's data set, the fourth most popular answer was that they would like to explore etymology more deeply. And it is true that while our etymology data is extremely rich and detailed, and we're really proud of it, using, to its, using it to its full potential isn't always straightforward. Um, there's another factor, there also seems to be a large general demand for etymology visuals and for info, and infographics recently, and for applications and websites that generate them. Quite a lot of products like this have been launched in relative, even in rel relatively recent months, and here are just a few. So these are some of the factors that really motivated us to look into the potential of using the OED data set to create etymology visuals. Our etymologies, especially the ones we've revised, tend to use quite standardized structures and formulae. And they're also marked up with tagging that's normally invisible to the reader of OED.com, but could easily be put to more use than it is now. So it seemed to us that a visualization tool based on OED etymology data could make an important contribution to what we know to be a growth area. The first question to ask, of course, is what exactly do we want this tool to do? And several different use cases presented themselves to us. I'd like to show you four of these today. So the first and probably most obvious use for a visual is really clarification. So the old adage that a picture speaks a thousand words. On the right of your screen there um, is our etymology for the noun spirit. It might not be very clear, but don't worry, I won't be going into it in a huge amount of detail. So this was an entry that was published in the OED.com update this June. And to be honest, I've chosen it really mostly with Halloween in mind, but not because it's particularly special or unusual in any way. 
as OED etymologies go, it's not unusually long or complicated, but it's still quite a dense chunk of solid text to digest, even, I think, probably for the expert reader. Of all parts of an OED entry, etymologies are probably the least accessible to the non-specialist, or as somebody put it to me the other day, the etymology is the scariest bit. So there is quite a lot of technical detail there, and all of it interesting, relevant, and important. But the sheer volume of information can make it difficult to pick out the main narrative. We do now supply a brief origin statement here for people who just really want to know what sort of formation is this. Um, so here you could, might be able to see if your screen is clear enough. This is a word of multiple origins, borrowed partly from French and partly from Latin. But inevitably there will be times when a reader needs to know more than that, but finds it quite hard to see the wood for the trees in the full etymology text. So here's how we think a visualization tool might go some way to meeting that particular need. It could use the etymology data to generate a simple flow chart of just the main transmission of a word in an entry, giving a level of detail that sort of bridges the gap really between the minimal origin statement and the fuller etymological discussion below. The diagram we thought could then be used alongside the full text as a sort of explanatory visual aid to make its content more accessible and easier to use and navigate. So perhaps it could provide a handy sort of outline or research or summary for the researcher in a hurry, or maybe serve as a sort of friendly guide map to the full discussion for a student who might otherwise find it a bit intimidating or confusing. So to focus in on some of the features of this transmission map. So you can see here it's presented in a timeline format moving forward in time as you read from left to right. So this effectively works in the opposite direction from the written etymology, which starts with your English word and then moves backwards in time step by step through ulterior etymons. But this seemed to us quite an intuitive way of presenting the information and possibly a useful alternative to perspective to the one given in the etymology text proper. And it should be easy enough for a visualization tool to allow users to set their own preferences when it comes to the sort of direction of flow. Lexical items on the transmission pathway are then presented with brief glosses in boxes here. So you can see the Latin words on this diagram are given in turquoise boxes and the French um, in lilac. And then the English word itself in a larger box here styled to match the presentation of OED entries. Etymological relationships between these lexical items are then represented by arrows, which I've introduced briefly in the key here. After quite a lot of discussion, this is one simple scheme that we came up with. So as a top level distinction, it seemed most useful to distinguish between borrowing on the one hand and internal formations on the other. So blue arrows here indicate borrowing between languages and gray ones indicate either development with, happening within a single language or lineal descent from a parent language. So this does leave the gray arrow to do quite a lot of work uh, covering several etymological mechanisms really, including for instance, things like conversion from one part of speech to another, clipping or shortening, back formation, alteration. But in cases where it seems helpful to specify which process is involved, we've considered the option of doing so in small text below the relevant arrow here, as I've done for the arrow on the key. Then cases where two or more lexical items are combined, as here and here on the spirit map, are shown by the converging curly bracket arrow symbol here. Again, this covers several distinct processes really as we would identify in our etymology origin statements. So any situation where the OED etymology text would use the plus symbol, such as compounding and derivation by adding a suffix or prefix, as well as things like blending. 
connections that are uncertain, for instance, where the etymology text says perhaps or probably or apparently, are then indicated by fading the relevant arrow with the level of uncertainty specified in italics above. Now, this is quite a lot of explanation for what I hope is actually a relatively self-explanatory diagram. I hope it tells the story of the main transmission of the noun spirit in quite a clear and intuitive way. That is, within classical Latin, the verb meaning to breathe is combined with a noun forming suffix to give a noun spiritus. That then develops by lineal descent into French esprit and the French noun and the Latin noun, that's its etymon, are then both borrowed into English in the 14th century. Of course, the transmission map here is very much a simplification of the account given in the ret written etymology. Um, that's sort of the point, really. Um, there's naturally a balance to be struck, though, between detail on the one hand and clarity on the other. And there's obviously a limit to how much information it's possible to encode in an image before it starts to become cluttered and confusing. As the point of the visual here it was really to sit alongside the OED etymology and make it easier to process, we've opted to keep the display quite clean and sparse to maximize clarity. I should also add that this particular display scheme is by no means one that we're firmly wedded to. Rather than colour, for instance, we could equally use different styles of our arrow to symbolise different relationships. Um, were we to develop a tool further, we would look to do so, obviously, in consultation with designers who have the expertise to maximise accessibility. For example, for people with colour deficiency, colour vision deficiency, or to enable printing in black and white. But that said, I hope that this shows the sort of concept that we have in mind and perhaps the potential that a visual could have to convey a relatively large amount of etymological information quite clearly and efficiently. So now to our second use case for a future visualization tool. The etymology section of the entry for spirit we've just seen probably contains pretty much all the information that most readers would want to know about the route by which that word came into English. But the same can't be said for every word by any means. So often the transmission pathway of a word will be split across several OED entries. And in that case, tracing the etymology of a word right back as far as it goes in the OED involves piecing the relevant information together using cross-reference link, cross links to hop from entry to entry and making notes as you go. This can be quite time consuming and laborious. For instance, imagine that you want to know the ulterior etymon of the word melon. So you look that entry up in the OED. And the etymology at melon now one tells you that it's a 14th century borrowing from French that this immediate French etymon is descended from a post-classical noun, mello, which in turn is probably shortened from an older Latin name for the fruit, mello pepo. But if you want to find out where that came from, then you need to leave this entry by following the cross-reference to the entry mello pepon to pick up the trail there. Again, though, that only gets you so far. It tells you that the classical Latin fruit name is a borrowing of a Greek compound and identifies the elements that make it up. But for their etymology, you need to up sticks again and hop across to the OED entries for male noun two and pepon noun. And then the ulterior etymon of Greek pepon is covered at yet another entry, the noun cook. So in fact, if you want to trace the entire transmission pathway of the word melon back as far as it goes in the OED, you need to consult not one entry, but five. A tool designed to generate transmission maps of the kind that we saw at Spirit should be able to do a lot of this legwork for you by automating the process of entry hopping to join all the relevant information together and then presenting the word's entire transmission pathway in a single visual. If a user were keen to know more detail, then this would still be available in the full end etymology text of the individual entries, which I've 
linked in the box here. But a visual could be a useful way to save time and effort in this sort of situation, synthesizing actually quite a large amount of information and presenting, I think, a useful overview. So far, I've talked about some ways to visualize the etymology of a single English word. Building on these ideas, we have also experimented with some ways in which a tool that maps transmission pathways might actually be used more adventurously to reveal etymological connections between different words in the OED and allow you to explore them. So imagine, for example, you just use the tool like we did just now to map the transmission pathway of melon. You might be interested to know more about one of the words in the timeline here and wonder which other English words might ultimately be derived from it. So say if this Hellenistic Greek word for an edible gourd caught your eye, the visualization tool could then give you a list of OED headwords whose main transmission also includes this word and let you select which transmission pathway to expand forwards. This would show you then how this Greek word is also at several removes. Also, at several removes gives rise to two more English nouns denoting edible gourds, and that's pompion here. And then by alteration of that, the noun pumpkin. Or you might wonder whether classical Latin pepon here ever gave rise to a word in English, and then expanding the pathway forwards from that node shows you that you're right, it was borrowed into Old English to give this word for a melon or pumpkin. And similarly, extending transmission pathways forwards from Latin melo pepo brings you to a related word that you might not have known about at all, the obsolete 16th century loan word, loan word melo pepon, which was used up until the mid 18th century for various types of squash. Or finally, by selecting the Greek word for apple, you could opt to see how that word is related to the name of another English fruit, and that's the peach. So as I hope you can see, this kind of functionality would allow you to create your own bespoke tree or root map of etymologically related words. And this one shows you that melon is not only related to pumpkin, but also to peach. If each of the boxes for OED headwords here worked then as a clickable link to that entry, you could then use this, the network that you built yourself as a kind of interactive map to access and explore the dictionary. So navigating between OED entries for all of these related words to discover how they've been used in English over time. So in the same kind of way that you can now explore the dictionary according to semantic principles, using the underpinning tree structure of the historical thesaurus, a network like the ones I've been showing could allow you to explore the dictionary according to etymological principles. This seemed quite an interesting concept to us, and I look forward to hearing what you think about it. Now this brings me to the last use case that I want to show you today. One question that you might reasonably want the OED to answer is, are these two English words that I'm interested in etymologically related to each other? A visualization tool that works on the principles I've shown here should enable to, you to answer this kind of question by mapping the main transmission pathway of each of your two words back to their ultimate etymon in the OED to see whether the two pathways meet at any point along their course. And this would then show you whether the words share a common ancestor. So say, for instance, you wondered whether the noun cookie was related to the verb to cook. The visualization tool could then create you a full transmission map for the two words, first cookie and then cook. As you can see here, the two transmission pathways do not join at any point along their course, they remain parallel. This means that they don't share a common ancestor. And so we have an answer to our question, no, cookie and the verb cook aren't directly etymologically related to each other. On the other hand, having seen this little uh, diagram, you might want to ask, is cookie related to cake? So in this case, mapping the two words together shows that their transmission pathways do in fact converge to shared ancestor. So they both 
go back to the same Germanic base in pink here. So in this case, our answer is yes, cookie is etymologically related to cake. Using visualization functionality to interrogate the dictionary like this actually becomes quite addictive and can reveal some quite unexpected connections. And for this one, you have to bear with me as I scroll my visual smoothly down. For instance, you can find out that cook might not be related to cookie, but it is related to biscuit. And then all the health, healthy fruit and vegetable words that we looked at earlier are related to biscuit too. So melon, pumpkin and peach and friends all ultimately go back to the same Indo-European base here, meaning to cook. Incidentally, I'm not sure that whether that means that a chocolate biscuit counts as one of your five a day, but I would like to think it did. And again, as well as revealing etymological connections, a map built this way could provide a way for you to access the OED, navigating between the entries marked on your tree by using their boxes as clip, clickable links to open and explore all that they have to offer. So to sum up, Everything I've presented here is a mock-up built by hand, by human, in fact, by me, from OED etymology data. Um, and I've just mocked up really one possibility for using visualization to explore the dictionary and hence the language. I hope I've given an idea of the kind of functionality that a future tool might be able to provide and some of the research questions it might help to answer. I just wanted to say um, a big thank you to you, Tanya, for presenting this. This was really very interesting. Thanks again. Wishing everyone a good day or evening or morning, wherever you are. So from us for now, it's a goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.